Hello, I'm Dr. Paul DeGramji, family physician at Collegeville Family Practice in Collegeville, Pennsylvania, and medical director of health services at Ursinus College, also in Collegeville, Pennsylvania. The purpose of this program is to discuss the diagnosis and management of atopic dermatitis in the primary care setting, including the role of shared decision-making can play in improving patient satisfaction and ultimately patient outcomes. This activity has been developed in association with the National Eczema Association and their Coalition United for Better Eczema Care Initiative, or CUBE-C. Joining me in the discussion today are Dr. Robert Sidbury, Megan Lewis, a nurse practitioner, and Rayel, a patient with atopic dermatitis. Dr. Sidbury, would you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Robert Sidbury. I'm a pediatric dermatologist at Seattle Children's Hospital and the University of Washington School of Medicine. Welcome, Robert. Megan? Hi, I'm Megan Lewis. I'm a nurse practitioner at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in the Division of Allergy and Immunology. Hello, Megan. And Rayel? Hi, I'm Rayel, and I am a eczema patient uh, since birth, or atopic dermatitis, and uh, I am going to be the, the personal case study for today. We'll start off this case study with a recent office visit by Rayel to her primary care doctor for discomfort due to an eczema flare. Rayel, hello. Hello, how are you? I'm doing fine, but I understand you're not doing so well. Yeah, no, I'm not. I um, Actually, my eczema came back, big flare, um, and yeah, I need some, some help. I actually, I, I went to even another uh, uh, physician to get a steroid, a higher steroid, just really quick, just something really in and out, but he wouldn't do it for me, um, and I've just been suffering, so I'm so happy to have this appointment, and you can get me something to help out. Well, sure, let me just make sure I understand. So you said you got an asthma flare. When did it actually begin? Yeah, um, well, my, ex my eczema flare, it, um, it was probably... It started ever since really the weather started changing with mm -hmm. the, the winter. Um, okay. And so as we started going more into the winter, I just was waiting it out, mm -hmm. but it just keeps getting worse. Where is it affecting you? Where is it at its worst right now? Um, is it everywhere? It's <laughs> potentially, um, <laughs> but uh, but it's really bad. Actually, I can show can you, show you a me? little. Yeah. It went down a little, but my uh, my arms, okay. yeah. So it's you've been scratching bad. at this a lot, aren't you? Yeah, a little. Well, yeah, you can see itchy. those marks. Yeah. Okay. So. So you really have a bad flare up. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. And what have you done so far? Um, a lot of the the routine, uh, you know, uh, has been 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 the same. A lot of baths and moisturizing. You're taking your um, tepid baths, putting a little mm, bit of. Uh, yeah. of uh, the bleach, a bleach and, in there, yeah, okay. moisturizing yeah. right afterwards, yes. all over from head to toe. You've been doing yes. that, yes, okay, yes. and making sure that the clothes you're wearing are like mm -hmm. cottony and soft. Yeah, I try. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't make me um, itch, but it probably, I probably should do better with the clothing. Um, are yeah. you putting any medicine at all on your skin right now? No. Okay. So. All right. So in the past, what's helped mm -hmm. you is when I've given you like a medium grade steroid cream. Right. That's yes. what's really yeah. I think that's what you so. kind of need, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Because the one that I was using, it just it doesn't work anymore. So I probably need something a no little problem. stronger. I can give you a prescription for a really large tube so you can use mm -hmm. it on, on all the different parts affecting you. Yeah. Twice a day should be effective. And for most people, like within a couple of days, it's a little bit better. and a week, a lot better. That's what our goal. Okay. Okay. And in two weeks or so, maybe you're starting to back off a little bit. But that's probably when I should see you again. Okay. But you know what? There's a couple other things, Rayel. Um, first of all, there are other medicines out there other than just steroid creams. Really? For eczema? Ab absolutely. They're kind of a different class of medicines. They're called TCIs. At some point, we may address them. And guess what else? There's also now um, another cream that's out there that's not even any of those two categories. So there's a lot I can do for you. Plus, also, there's injectable medicines, okay? Mm -hmm. Injection meaning like it's a... Um, it's a it's a medication that that we inject underneath your skin and I can actually mm. even train you to do it It's really cool wow. and you do that every couple of weeks or so These are mm. medicines that we use for kind of advanced and severe cases So if right. things don't get better mm. and you've been suffering for many many years mm. if things don't get better We can consider some of the other sources as well. All right. Oh, I think it's yeah. important for you to know. Oh, no, that's wonderful Okay, Thank so you. when you come back in two weeks, we'll go over them I'll give you some information about mm -hmm. about them in fact National Eczema Association, the, the website, you can just Google it, National Eczema Association. Yeah. You can put it on your Google and, and go to the website and get a lot of this information there as well. Oh, wow. 
Wow. Have you ever have you ever gone there or done that? Or? No, this is awesome. This is the first time that I'm hearing about this. I, I really, I need to learn so much more. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad. I mean, you know, knowledge is power. Yeah. So for you to know what's out there, what you need to do, you already know about the bathing part. You already mm -hmm. know about the lotions and moisturizers. You know about the bleach. You know about all these other things that we've mm -hmm. talked about. We just go, uh, go a little bit further and do more yeah. for you depending on what you need. I'll yeah. just give you the prescription for the steroid cream you're used to. Mm -hmm. Have you come back in two weeks? We'll go from there. Awesome. Sound okay? Thank you. Yes. So nice to see you yes, again. Yes, thanks. All right. <laughs> awesome. Excellent. So yes, uh, uh, Robert and Megan, we're going to be talking about Rayelle and her experiences throughout her life with atopic dermatitis. Rael, you started with eczema since birth, isn't that right? Yes. Tell us about that. Yes, I was uh, born with eczema. Um, I actually came out feeling like sandpaper, so it wasn't much of a, a, a question as to what was what. Um, I had eczema, it's in my family line, and that was it. So you were born with it, your, your mom obviously told you about this as you were growing older, and, uh, and you had sandpaper skin. Yes. Is that, is that common to see atopic dermatitis at that age, upon birth? It doesn't always present right at birth, but it's a pediatric disease, no doubt about it. Upwards of 50, 60 percent of patients are diagnosed by one year of age, close to 90 by kindergarten, so it's a pediatric condition. And how is it diagnosed in infancy, uh, Megan? So it's, it's typically a clinical diagnosis. It will involve, in infants, it can involve the entire body. Um, typically, they're very itchy. Their skin is dry. Um, they probably have some excoriations from where they've scratched themselves. Um, but dry, red, scaly plaques are kind of the hallmark of the disease. It typically spares the diaper area in infants, though, so that's a good trick if it's not in the diaper that it might be atopic dermatitis. So probably... Rael's mom, when she took her to her well baby visit, the two month visit mentioned to her doctor, what's going on with, with, with my daughter's skin, right? So what would her doctor have recommended? What would be the treatment for atopic dermatitis in, in, a, in a baby, in an infant like that? Well, we definitely think differently about babies because they're little, their weight relative to their surface area is different, so they absorb more of anything we put on. So first and foremost, we would start with good skin care. We'd want to make sure that they were uh, bathing and moisturizing properly, which to me means ideally a daily bath followed immediately by a bland emollient. In a baby who doesn't really complain about the thickness or the greasiness of a product, I would tend to re recommend an, an emollient that was greasier like an ointment. That should be sufficient initially. Um, Rael, did you have a family history of it? Does it run in your family? Did your mother say anything about that to you? Yes, so uh, my grandmother on my mother's side uh, actually has it, uh, and then my mother had it throughout childhood some, but, but I, neither ha have been as severe as me. Um, so gradually, and she, even my mom, she uh, suffers with it gradually on her hands now, but, um, but I, it's just been literally everywhere on my body at some point. So, all right, so uh, your mom probably started with the usual treatment with moisturizer, like we said. Mm -hmm. Do you remember her telling you what else she did for you after, after a certain amount of time? Yes, yeah, so uh, yeah, definitely the, the moisturizing um, definitely helped, but your skin gets used to it. Um, I'm, a lot of us, I'm sure, are used to, we, we can't use the same thing forever, um, and so we just have to switch up. Um, and then from there, uh, of course, there's definitely medications um, that doctors want to give, and we, we took it. Um, it was back and forth. Uh, sometimes it, it's a balance, because you don't always want your child on medication. So but it was definitely a balancing act. Yeah, and did it also alter how things went in the family? I mean, do you have other brothers and sisters and how it affected their behavior around you? Yes, I have an older brother. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess I had to get a lot of the attention. Um, <laughs> And I mean, in, in other circumstances, that's amazing. But uh, <laughs> but but no, not in this. Um, there, I mean, I had no other choice but for everyone to to be at my my needs. Um, so. So as Rael's growing up, she has different needs, as she said. How does it differ in childhood versus uh, later childhood? You know, I think eczema can be a full time job sometimes. Um, I recommend when families have young children, every diaper change to, to moisturize them with something, and that can sometimes help kind of keep the skin hydrated. Um, but it's a, it's a chronic disease that, that it takes a lot of work, and um, we'll talk about some other therapies, I think, in a bit, but they're time-consuming, and, um, 
and the, the, the recommendations are the same to do that daily bath um, or rinsing off regularly and then moisturizing as soon as you get out with some type of an emollient. So that's really important. I mean, when we look at the pathophysiology of atopic dermatitis, there is a dryness problem uh, and there is uh, bacteria and allergens that are going through the skin. So they need to bathe. They need to get the, uh, uh, the allergens and bacteria off their skin with uh, a tepid bath along with a little bit of bleach, is that right? Yep, so there's a, a treatment option called bleach baths that we recommend a lot. Um, we recommend non-concentrated um, non bleach um, and you would submerge in the, in the bleach bath. It's the same concentration as a chlorinated swimming pool. Families are often resistant to it at first, um, but when you equate it to a swimming pool, sometimes they're more willing to accept it. Um, but after they've been in the bleach bath, it's important to rinse off after. In toddlers, um, if you're worried about them splashing in their face, you can just pour the bleach concentration over their skin, the bleach and water concentration. I don't know if you have other. Let, yeah, let's get more specific. So in a tub of water, how much bleach are we putting in there? Yeah, so if it really is a, uh, an infant and you're uh, having so little water, you can actually measure it out, a teaspoon per gallon. Uh, not too many patients who are older measure out their baths. So then if it's a bath, we'll have parents um, put in maybe a, a full tub of bath, a quarter cup of bleach Very maximum. Little, yeah. However, some older patients take showers. And so then you can literally get a bucket, a gallon bucket of water, put a teaspoon of bleach in it, and then take a washcloth and touch the areas of your skin where you might want to uh, subject them to bleach. And then by definition, you're rinsing it off because it's a shower. Now these bathing and showering is the foundation works of treatment, isn't it? But then you also said moisturizer. Is that something that you have been doing pretty regularly then with the bath and then Oh yes, um, every single every night, um, especially when when things are rough. Um, every night a bath um, is definitely necessary if I want to wake up with my face <laughs> a lot of times, um, and so and to have a more calm. Uh, s time of sleep. I actually mix my baths um, with different things. So the, the bleach and then also I'll put in maybe some dead sea salt or, or something like that. I'll mix it in order to still get moisture when it's done. Like that's just something that I came up with. But, um, but also even essential oils to, to just er anything that can calm you at nighttime. I sleep with a um, dehumidifier. All of that actually okay. helps. Excellent. Now, all right, so she has a nice way of doing things, but what questions do parents have? You know, so, all right, you've taught them about the bathing, about moisturizing. What other questions do parents have about their eczema? They must be really concerned about it. Lots of concerns. I think one thing you brought up is really really important that a lot of families will see lots of products advertised like things you can add to a bath and sometimes they're not worth the money in some cases where mm -hmm. they get so diluted within the bath that they don't help um, if you're not directly applying it onto the skin. So I think really helping the family to, to navigate through um, what's worth the therapy and what's not where essential oils might be helpful for you they might really irritate another patient and so it's very individualized what you try for each patient. But Robert you know let's talk about about the diagnosis itself. When you give a diagnosis of eczema to a parent, say your child has eczema, do they get alarmed, do they get upset? What kind of questions do they have and how do you allay their fears? Yeah, so the number one and two questions are why and when's it going to go away? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and both of those questions are difficult to answer because as Megan alluded, um, first of all, there's eczema that you read about in the textbooks and then there's Rael's eczema or there's the patient in front of you's eczema. They're not always the same. And so what I'll tell parents is that this is a condition which we're going to manage together. We're going to manage it safely. We're going to try and identify triggers uh, that you identify and tell me about. And I may or may not help you with testing if it's appropriate. And we'll eliminate those things. We'll sustain with good skin care, bathing, moisturizing, all we've talked about. And when prescription medications are necessary to take that next step, we'll take that next step. Excellent. But atopic dermatitis, atopy. Asthma comes to mind, allergies come to mind, allergic rhinitis comes to mind. Um, Rael, you actually developed asthma, didn't you? Yes. Um, I was officially diagnosed at seven years old. So, um, yes, through time. And then even before that, my uh, mother tells me that I was given asthma treatments um, at a, a doctor um, prior. and But I wasn't diagnosed with it so uh, that was like concerning for her so she moved on um, into a children's hospital um, and they diagnosed me okay. and it was uh, so from there and I knew what was happening but that was the process I mean I had eczema, nails, eczema, nails, asthma and then 
allergies were always there, so. How common are comorbidities with atopic dermatitis, Megan? So extremely common. So a, a lot of patients who have atopic dermatitis have co-occurring asthma, as Rayel described, environmental allergies and food allergies as well. So often we see a family history of those allergic diagnoses, um, and the patient can often have multiple diagnoses, but they can have just atopic dermatitis too. But Is there a family history of this uh, with you? Uh, I do have allergies. Um, no with family history though, like with your mm -hmm. mom or brother or other people have anything like this? Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, my mom definitely has the eczema, but my brother has, like, um, hay fever. Okay. So, like, that's, like, that's his, his worst thing. He might have some eczema, uh, but, but it's not really. Um, but, yes, so my brother has that, and then he's also allergic to peanuts. It's just not as severe as me. So that's there. But besides us, nobody else in our we've my parents have asked so many people, no one is allergic to peanuts. So, Robert, so we have eczema, we have food allergy, like she said, um, we have asthma. Um, any other comorbidities other than that that go along with uh, atopic dermatitis? Well, there's some that we've always known about but haven't called out as such, like skin infections. Mm -hmm. Patients with atopic dermatitis are more susceptible to staph infections, for instance, and that's a critical thing that can not only be an independent problem, but one that can drive the eczema. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons we think that bleach baths help both prevent skin infections and independently improve eczema. Pain is something that is little uh, noticed by providers, often noticed by patients. Itching chronically with open skin is painful. There are newer comorbidities that we're just learning about, like attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD possibly others like anemia, um, things that we need to have on our radar screen but aren't as well described as those first ones we mentioned. So do we then actively seek out and ask for these comorbidities, Megan? So I think it's really important to, to take a, a lengthy history. Um, one other piece that I would add is that disrupted sleep and so um, families are not sleeping well, not just the patient but the entire family's sleep cycle is disrupted. There's been some good research that came out to show that even when you control for other comorbidities, um, obstructive sleep apnea is higher in patients who have atopic dermatitis. So really thinking about all the things, don't let the eczema mask other diagnoses that might be there um, that maybe you could address that would help the sleep cycle and help the family. So it's a really a systemic problem, or rather a, um, affecting the entire life of, of the person, and in fact, even the family. So in that rail, you know, when you were growing up, uh, how did your doctors uh, try to address these issues? Did they talk to you as well as your mom, as well as other family members? What kind of education was there, and what kind of things occurred at that age group? Yes, well, definitely. Um, they've spoken to to us as a family. My 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 mother, and my father, but my mom was the one. My, my dad was at work a lot, so my mom went to the, the appointments with me. But um, they talked um, about all the different things um, that needed to be done in connection. Because now I had dual situation with the asthma as well. So there was there were classes um, for asthma, and but that's, it was a direct effect to eczema. Like it's the same um, in, in certain ways, just shows in different ways. But um, so detergents and, and just dust mites, couldn't have teddy bears or anything for a while. And, and um, just, just any basic things, um, maybe some eliminations, but all of my, the, the cleaning, home care, all that was changed um, for since, I can remember um, some minor things such as even uh, cow's milk. That was the only thing that was taken out back then for the most part as a big deal was dairy. Um, and I, yeah, so no cow's milk at the time and all that. So through life I had my, my plant-based milk. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so it's so a lot of, your whole life has to change um, and your, your parents do it yeah. with you. So Megan, she talked about a lot of avoidance of a lot of things certain foods, um, environmental issues. She talked about uh, teddy bears and dust mites and covering mattresses. All these, do we discuss them with patients? So I think it's really important to think about triggers for each individual patient. We know that people are at greater risk to have environmental allergies if they have atopic dermatitis. So working with an allergist or someone who can do some skin testing to see what your true triggers are because you don't want to do all this work, and if it's not a trigger, we want to limit how much work has to be done. So if dust mite, if you are dust mite sensitive, using dust mite covers, dust mite 
um, covers for the mattresses and the pillows can really make a difference. You can freeze your stuffed animals and some other tricks to, to allow the stuffed an uh, one stuffed animal to stay perhaps or washing them regularly can make a difference. Um, but then thinking through food allergies is another piece. If you have someone who has systemic eczema, they're at a greater risk to have false positives on food testing, both on blood and skin. Um, and so I think it's we really have to go cautiously and carefully to know if there was any signs of an IgE-mediated reaction where you eat the food and within 30 minutes to two hours you have symptoms. Um, so Robert, not everybody needs to have food allergy testing or skin testing, right? No, they don't. I think everybody, every provider has to have an open mind to the possibility, just as mm -hmm. Megan rightly points out. But then address the fundamentals of good skin care, take a wonderful history like Megan said, and put those pieces together, and then see where you go, whether testing is appropriate or just empiric treatment without change of diet or environment. And when there's improvement, then that sort of solves a lot of the questions that parents and kids have had if they get better in the same environment with just some simple therapies. Okay. So there you are, Rael, you're doing pretty good with your, with your mom, the doing with the baths and with the emollients and everything. Then you get a flare, don't you? Describe one of those for us. Absolutely. Um, it's always, you can't expect it. <laughs> um, it it's just, it comes. Um, and so it, it, it does knock you down, like for the first instance a lot of times, um, but uh, you do what you know that you always have to do. Um, you What's do it like? What, mm -hmm. Where does it strike you and what does it feel like? Um, it can be anywhere. Um, growing up, I just got over, I was okay if it wasn't on my face. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I would, I would move on with life like nothing's happening um, as long as I could just treat it when I'm home. Nobody needs to know. But, um, but yeah, so it goes different, different areas. There's no control as to where it'll pop up. Did you have to sort of resist yourself from scratching yourself or? Right, like I'm doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> so. Does it also hurt? Yes, there's a, a stinging, there's a burning, yes. Does it affect yes. you emotionally when you have a flare? Oh, definitely, when it, absolutely. Um, especially when it just doesn't stop. Um, itching, though that's horrible. Um, and you can't sleep and all that. You have to, to practice some very calming, calming things. And, yeah. So it affects you emotionally. We're going to talk about that in a second. But let me ask you, you two. So when somebody comes in with, like Rael, who has a really bad flare, where do you start? So I think. Um I think Rael captures the unpredictability of this disease and how frustrating it can be that you go to bed looking well and the next morning you wake up irritated. You, you shared that before. And I think um, really talking through what they were doing when they were well and really trying to narrow down on what was the trigger. Was it a viral illness or was it um, you know, something else, was it the change in the weather or the season change that triggered the flare? And then building a treatment plan using some prescription medications probably to get better and then get back onto a maintenance therapy to, to sustain the wellness. What are some of the fundamentals of treatment when it comes to a flare, Robert? Yeah, so we go back to our old standby, which is the first line treatment for atopic dermatitis, which is topical corticosteroids. Mm -hmm. So we sort of judge the strength and the vehicle of that topical corticosteroid based on the age of the patient and their preference if they're old enough to express one. Mm -hmm. And also think about the long-term use and safety in terms of making sure it's something that's precisely for this context we're talking about, which is a flare, get that flare under control, and then hopefully fall back to maintenance therapy, primarily with moisturizers, and then more intermittent use of the prescription medicines. Okay. There are also TCIs and, and PDE inhibitors. Can you <laughs> talk about those two just briefly? Yeah, that's absolutely right. TCIs, topical calcineurin inhibitors, non-steroidal medications that have been around since 2000, 2001. It's not terribly new anymore. Okay. Approved for kids older than two years of age. They are non-steroidal, but they do have a boxed warning associated with their use, primarily to prevent inappropriate use in infants. Yeah. Um, one's an ointment, one's a cream. Tacrolimus, pomecrolimus are the two products. There's a new topical phosphodiesterase inhibitor, which is an ointment, which is also approved for kids two years of age and older, which is for mild to moderate patients with atopic dermatitis. Not a steroid, no boxed warning. New, and so as with any new product, probably a little bit more expensive, less accessible, and there's a little bit more stinging with that product than there has been with the others. And there's one injectable right now, which is a monoclonal antibody. 
uh, that's available, is that right? Absolutely right. Dupilumab is a new biologic medication that's been approved for adults since 2017. Just recently was approved down to 12 years of age, which is very exciting. Okay. So, so Rayo, uh, how long do these flares last? And by the way, are they predictable at all? Can you tell, tell when they're going to happen? Yeah, so it's it's not that predictable. You you through life you do realize what what hurts it more. So definitely seasonal. Um, mm -hmm. That definitely is a, a factor. Winters are always horrible. It always has been. Now, it's interesting though because summertime as a child I can remember that being worse um, in a lot of times. So it's just extreme weather. I feel like so harsh cold, harsh heat. Um, body does not like it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something you, you have to just be extra precautious around those times is usually when I would change my diet. I would just be very more precautious to kind of when the flare-ups do come, it just won't completely disfigure my mm -hmm. uh, how I look. Mm -hmm. So if you get a flare, you go to a doctor's office. What is a good, successful doctor's office for you? It's, it's different now than uh, growing up. Um, and because growing up, then yes, these steroids, they work for me um, as a teenager, uh, topical steroids, they work for me. And then also because I would have the allergies, big allergies as well. So my eyes would be huge, everything. They, I would get the topical steroids, um, but during the daytime, um, also some, some oral steroids as well. Um, but it would be in order for, for daytime and then also nighttime to help me go to sleep um, and then to calm inflammation. That's just always been been the thing, to calm inflammation, get medication for that, um, higher medication when necessary because I already would be using the steroids uh, every day actually, which was not what I'm supposed to do. Um, that definitely was a misuse, but it, it, it kept things level and I didn't I, I never looked at side effects or anything. This is just my life. Um, when things get worse, you go to the doctor and you get a, a higher steroid. Um, and yeah, but through life, that you, it, it catches up with you um, at a time when there's other factors as to, to why things may be at its worst. And if a steroid doesn't work, mm -hmm. then um, it kind of went haywire. Okay. So she mentioned oral antihistamines. Uh, how, how helpful are they? And one other thing I want to ask you guys, what about oral or systemic steroids? How about those two issues? Right, so I'll take antihistamines. You can do steroids. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think reflexively when, when someone is itching, we want to get them better and the families always ask for what can I do for the itch even after you've gone through all these therapies for the skin. Um, so often people prescribe antihistamines and the studies are really not great and it's not indicated as a treatment just for eczema. They might be helpful in someone who has some allergic rhinitis or significant seasonal allergies, they might be helpful. If you have a toddler who's really having difficulty sleeping, something like hydroxyzine might be helpful. There's some good studies on melatonin use to help with sleep and eczema healing, but, but, ref but we shouldn't just automatically be pres prescribing antihistamines. Yeah, I can sum up my feelings about systemic corticosteroids in three words. Just say no. <laughs> uh, um, okay. They are seductively effective. Um, they will help the skin get better in a night or two in a child who's otherwise not sleeping. The family's affected, all the things we've talked about. Then all of a sudden you take this medicine and the world's different. Uh, instantly. The problem is... So, you, so rebound effect, is that re what you... That's the problem. Effect, yeah. The problem is when you come off of the medication, the eczema is back and sometimes with a vengeance. Yes. And it's not an appropriate intervention for a chronic disease. Okay, that's a very important point to know. All right, Rhea, let's shift our attention to... I mean, we talked about how it has affected you physically. How has eczema affected you in your emotional life, in your mental health, as you've gone through your schooling and later on? Yes, so through a child, definitely a very emotional, <laughs> very emotional child. And I mean, some people might say I am now, but um, is, <laughs> but um, yeah, so that's a, a huge thing to connect as to why you might be like, why am I so sensitive? I was very sensitive as a child, even minor, rep, rep, being reprimanded by like a teacher on minor things, um, I would just cry. <laughs> and I think that was a part of me just like, man, I'm causing a disruption again. And because there's so many things out of my control that I was caused a disruption because uh, it's just my body is how it was. Um, so that was, all that are, is mental and um, definitely um, 
it carries through with certain things, maybe being a, a people pleaser um, in certain ways. But um, but as you get older, I mean, you just you learn, you master the art of caring for eczema. You really do. Um, and but even but as an adult, it just came a time that it was like I have to stop masking this. <laughs> like I, this is me. This is a part of me. This has been my life. And so that's where the real mental change comes in, um, seeing like light in in the the pain and everything like that. So it's so some positives to it. Is that what you mean? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I'm forced to have an optimal health, um, optimal health as to taking care of myself. I have. I'm very strict with uh, how I take care of myself healthy-wise. I've learned so much about my body, the body in general, things that, that you just don't pay attention to because there's no reason, you think there's no reason to, but you should know the workings of your body and uh, what actually helps. So, so it's really important. So again, today, as far as your daily life, how do you think uh, atopic dermatitis has affected your personality? <laughs> Um, definitely, I would say some moods um, for sure, and and you have to learn to communicate um, what you're feeling because even like right now, yeah, I'm having great conversation, but I mean, I could be drained, and this this could be like personality type, but like in in another hour, I'll be drained um, because of all of the energy that I've used in order to kind of cancel out the itching that I feel right now in talking and being normal, um, all of that energy has to level out again. So I think that's good. Well, Robert, Megan, I'm sure you'll agree this has been so informative to, to see how Rayelle has gone through her life with, with atopic dermatitis. Thank you so very much. So this concludes our presentation on the management of atopic dermatitis in the primary care office. And we hope you found this activity enjoyable, educational and that has provided you with a foundation of the overview of the ongoing care of your patients with atopic dermatitis. Now, for additional information on AD, please go to the National Eczema Association's website, nationaleczema.org, and encourage your patients to check out eczemawise.org, an exciting new resource developed by the National Eczema Association. So on behalf of the faculty and the patient who have helped produce this activity, we'd like to thank you for your participation. Thank you very much.